Hi, my name is David Kong and welcome to this tutorial on Codex. Codex. This is the first of two videos. One's going to be all about, um, this one is going to be all about how Codex work and what all those complicated, never explained terms mean. And the second video will be more practical talking about when you're actually exporting a video and you have all those settings, which ones you choose. I definitely recommend watching this one first. Don't skip to the second one just because just you want to know about export settings because what you learn in this video will help you make those decisions better. And I'm making these videos because so many people I hear, people who work with video, um, talk about codecs as if they're impossible to understand. That you know, Only if you're a technology whiz are you going to understand how codecs work. And that's not true at all. There definitely are some very complicated detail level things, that you, but you don't have to bother about those. Um, I'm just going to be teaching you the main principles so you can understand what people are talking about when they talk about codecs. So first of all, what is a codec? A codec stands for compressor decompressor. Codec is compressor decompressor because you have one set of rules basically is how you compress a file to make it smaller and how you decompress it to work with it, edit it, or display it with a video player. Some codecs are proprietary which means a certain company owns them and you, have, and you have to license them. And then some are not, so anybody can use them for free without having to sign any license agreement or anything. And so because of that, you know, some, some computers may not have a certain codec installed and may not be able to play or may not be able to compress certain codecs. And the first thing to talk about is the difference between a container and a codec. So a codec is something like H.264, that's a very commonly used one. Um, ProRes is another very commonly used one. Um, DNxHD is an Avid, very commonly used one. These are, these are codecs. Now, these are different from containers. A container is a type of file, which is not the same thing as a codec. I know it's confusing, but say we have a file called david.mov. This is a QuickTime video file. This is not a codec. This is what we call a container. So this is like a bucket, okay? And all sorts of things can go in here, all sorts of different codecs. So this david.mov might have H.264 in it, or might have ProRes in it, or might have DNxHD in it, or one of a whole bunch of other different things. But this is just the container, not the codec. Some other common, commonly used containers are things like .wmv, that's a Windows one. .avi is another um, Windows one. These are kind of going out of use. MOV is much more commonly used now. But first, make sure you understand when you're talking about a file, are you talking about a codec or a container? The next thing to talk about is types of codecs. Now, there are all sorts of different types of codecs, and they are used for different purposes. There is no single best codec for every situation. There, are, there is a best codec for a given situation, but not for every situation. Here are some of the common scenarios. The first one is your capture codec. So your capture codec is what your camera is recording. Capture codecs range quite a bit from um, a, a very low bit rate, I'll explain what bit rate means later, don't worry, a low bit rate H.264, all the way up to um, raw, which is sort of, <laughs> raw is technically not really a codec. Raw is sort of the absence of codec, but again, I'll get to that later. This is what your camera records. And then depending on your workflow, you may have an edit codec. So you may take this capture codec and turn it into something else to edit with because sometimes your capture codec is not very, very good for, for edit. And then you may do all your editing and then you export out into your delivery codec, which is the file that you put online or you give to your client or you know that gets burned to a DVD. And then you may also have an archival codec. So let's say for delivery, let me write this first. Let's say for delivery, your, code, your, your client wanted H.264, but maybe someday he'll come back and say, hey, actually I want a higher, you know, a, a better codec. And so it's always best to make an archival copy of a, of a finished finished project um, in case you want to come back to it you know years later or even weeks later you may have thrown away the project file or it may be hard to get back to it 
So in a given, a given project, I will often use four different codecs. So just to take an example, let's say I shoot a project on my C100 or a DSLR, and I get an H.264 codec, and then I convert to say a DNxHD codec, and that might be a lower quality DNxHD because I'm trying to go for speed over quality, and then I'll connect back to my H.264, and then I'll render out a delivery codec. Um, don't worry, I'll explain what all this is later. To a delivery codec, that might be H.264 again, because that's common to go on the web, say to Vimeo or something, but that will be a different H.264 than the one up here. And let's say I archive DNxHD, but this DNxHD might be a completely different DNxHD from the one over here, because this one I want for my archive to be um, a very, very high quality one, and I'm going for quality over speed, whereas back in the edit, I went for speed over quality. So I'll talk through the reasons for that. I'm just giving you an overview why why you might want to actually use four codecs on a single project, which I frequently do. Now let's talk about bit depth. Bit depth is an important uh, concept for not just for codecs, but um, for editing and rendering and things like that. Now the best way to think about bit depth is the number of values you have between dark and light. So if we just look at a big gradient here. Here we have pure white, here we have pure black, and here are all the shades of gray in between. And if you have a very, very deep bit depth, then you will not see any banding. You won't see any lines, vertical lines here, because it'll be a super, super, smooth, super smooth. But if you don't have enough possible values, then you start seeing artifacts that look like bands or, or lines, vertical lines in this example. Now let's jump back. So I'm gonna give you um, another sort of intuitive example, hopefully here. So this here is a sunset photo I shot, and has lots of different, lots of different colors here. We have, a, we have a, a really, really, really bright yellow all the way to white, and then many, many shades here. Now I'm gonna take this image down to an absurdly low bit depth. You would never have this in real life. But here's, basically we have like three shades between dark and light for each color, right? We, and that's about it. So we have like, in the sky here we have um, one shade of sort of a purplish and then a lighter, and then we have white and we have yellow and orange. Now I'm gonna add a couple more possibilities. Now we actually have three different colors in the sky here, three different possibilities, and I keep on going. Now we've got four different colors to choose from for the sky. And I, as I keep adding more and more colors, sort of upping the bit depth bit by bit, the image becomes more and more and more real as we get enough colors slowly to represent all the colors we want to until eventually we're back at the original image where we've got you know a, a real a real world this is an 8-bit color here so a real world 8 bits of bit depth and the way we talk about bit depth is usually in terms you'll hear you'll hear something like this is an 8-bit codec what this means is that there are two to the eight possible values for each of the red green and blue channels. So for every pixel there's a value, red, green, or blue, and how much of each, and you have two to the eighth, which equals 256. 256 possible values for each of these. And if you take 10 bit, 10 bit, then we have two to the 10 possible values for each of those, which is 1024. So you can see the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit is actually very significant. It's not just a difference of 8 to 10, it's a difference of 256 to 1024. So this is four times as deep, basically. And in pra practically speaking, you always want to be recording more bit depth, if possible. The deeper the bit depth, the more, um, the more values you have to work with, especially when you're doing things like color correction um, or doing any effects work, you, bit, deeper bit depth is better. Of course, you can get away with 8-bit, and you can make beautiful images with 8-bit. Don't get caught up too much in the numbers. But generally speaking, more bit depth is always better, when you're, when you're, especially for a capture codec. All right, now the next topic to talk about is chroma subsampling. Chroma, which basically just means color. Luma refers to, color, to, to brightness. Chroma refers to color. And then subsampling which sounds complicated, but it's actually not complicated at all. So you may often hear terms like 444 or 420 or 
422, or I should probably, probably put 422 here, and then 420 over here. These are three different types of chromosub sampling. Well, technically 444 means no chromosub sampling, 422 means some chromosub sampling, and 420 means a lot of chromosub sampling. Okay, so what is chromosub sampling? Basically, it means that you throw away some of the color data, some of the chroma data in your image. So let's say we have four pixels, and each of them starts off, uh, let's, let me go a little more even. Each of them starts off with its own brightness value and its own color value. Well, if you're doing 420 chroma subsampling, you're throwing away the color value on three of these pixels, and they all take the, co the color value from this pixel right here. So we keep the brightness from the other three pixels, but, but the color value of all four pixels comes from this one pixel. And you know, it might be that corner, might be a different corner, and the different ways of choosing it. But basically one out of four pixels has a color value. And then 420 means that for a block of four, um, one of them would get its value from the one next to it. So this one gets its value from that one, this one gets its value from that one. So we've got, basically we're throwing away half of the color values. And then 444 means, well, you keep them all. Um, no chroma subsampling happening at all. Each pixel has its own color and its own brightness. Surprisingly enough, even with 420, um, humans are really bad at noticing this. To give you an example, here's a still frame from a video I shot about how to use some lights. I'm gonna zoom, well, first I'll show you 100% here. Look at this um, logo I have here. You see there's a blue, there's green, there's white. If I zoom in, I keep on zooming farther and farther in. We go all the way to like, what am I, 1600%. So you can see an actual pixel by pixel basis. Let's take a look at these, <clears throat> the, the transition here from purple to green. If we go back out to 100% real quick, um, you'll see that there is a bright green and there's dark purple or dark blue, but there's no dark green in this image. And on the actual shirt, trust me, I have it, there is no dark green. It's either light green or next to a very, very dark purple. Okay, zoom way back in here. Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna pull open the color picker so you can see the colors really easily. Here we have a nice bright green, bright, bright green. Here we have dark blue, dark purple. The edge here, let's take a look at that color right there. That is a very dark green. But why is there a dark green? There should not be any dark green anywhere in my image. There should either be light green or dark purple. But this, this block of four pixels right here is all getting the same color value. They're all different shades, bright, medium, and dark of this same green. Even though logically there should, no, there should not be any dark green in here. It should be that color, but we get this green because um, it, we're happy we have chroma, chroma subsampling going on. Now if you zoom, even out to say, let's see, this is 500%. You can barely tell there's chroma, chroma subsampling. If you look really closely, you can see there's sort of a, a dark green fringe that shouldn't be there. That's 500%. If we go way back out to 100%, you'd never notice. Um, you're never gonna see the difference. So it's actually, a, it actually, it saves a lot of space and it's, it's a very efficient, efficient technique. The downside is that um, it's made, the downside is mainly with uh, chroma keying, that's green screen, um, or heavy effects work. If you think about it, if you're doing a green screen, let's say, you know, this would be kind of stupid, say I was trying to key out the KA and leaf with a green screen. Well, chroma keying works by separating out colors, and so I'm going to be grabbing some of that stuff that should be purple, but it's green technically, so my, my green screen color uh, chroma key is going to pull into the edges of my shirt here, that it shouldn't be. I really only want, want the bright green, but I'm gonna get a nasty edge if I try to color uh, chroma key this because it's gonna start grabbing things that are not really supposed to, supposed to be grabbed. So if you're doing heavy effects work, if you're doing, especially if you're doing green screening or blue screen, that kind of thing, it's always better to be further to the left on this spectrum here, doing less or no chroma sub sampling. Another very common technique is called spatial compression. Um, spatial compre compression is, well, I can't spell, spatial compression is when you have um, 
what you call blocks of the image that are all the same color or are very close to the same color. So let's say that an algorithm, a compression algorithm working on this image right here. Well, there's a ton of black space here. And what the algorithm would probably do would be something like it would start dividing up the image into blocks. So if I just draw a line, it would cut the whole image in half and say, hey, look, the entire bottom half of this image is all black. We don't have to store you know, hundreds and hundreds of values for every pixel. We can just say everything in the bottom half is black. And then it might do something like cut this into a half and say, uh, we can't do either one of these completely in half. But then it might cut each of these in half again and say, hey, ah, this is good. This bottom half is all black and we'll go over here too. And this bottom half is all black. And we cut in half here and hey, look, that one's all black. And then over here, this one's all black. And so it can cut up the image into blocks and say, hey, Look, we don't have to worry about compressing, you know, seven eighths, nine tenths of this image. All we need to worry about is this spot in here where all of the, all the blue writing is, and it'll it'll keep on going. It'll it'll divide things up until eventually, you know, it's separated all of this black, which, as you can imagine, saves a ton of space. Now, if you want to really see this in action, let's jump over to a video that I shot. Uh, this is a film I made of a beautiful town in Italy. And I'm going to jump through, there's a particular shot I'm thinking of, this shot. Now, um, it doesn't look bad here, it looks fine, you don't see any blocking this. Um, but if I blow this up, you'll start seeing something. So I'm going to grab a screenshot here. And let's jump in and view that full size. So here's that still frame in Photoshop. And if you start looking really closely, you'll notice some blockiness in here but I'm going to zoom in so you can see it even better. See these blocks here? Um, this is a very, the reason why it's, it's done this, like this is, you would think, oh, it's really bad. Um, the reason why it's done this is because this is a very low contrasty area, and usually codecs can get away with doing a lot of um, spatial compression um, in areas of low contrast. Unfortunately, in this one it is actually fairly obvious. It's kind of nasty. So just to make it even more clear, I'm going to do a levels command here, and I will up the contrast a whole bunch. So hopefully you can see this. See those blocks? Here we go. This is the algorithm deciding, oh, here's a whole block of color. I can make them all the same. I can make this whole block the same color. And you know, in the actual image that was, that was going to be compressed, these were not in big blocks. But in order to save space, the compression algorithm decided to compress them that way. Now, if I zoom way back out again to 100%, you can see you can still see this pretty nasty blocking. But if I turn off that crazy levels I put on, then you don't notice it nearly as much. That's an example, just another technique that um, is very, very commonly used in, in, in video codecs. Normally, it's really undetectable. It's only in unusual circumstances. You know, in this film, you know, five minute film, this is probably the only shot where you actually have visible blocking going on which is say, you know, it's, that's not too bad. Some of the codecs will have a fixed size. You can only have blocks up to a certain amount, and then some codecs will have no limits. You can have very, very large blocking if, um, if you want to, which, you know, if we go back to the uh, original example, you know, large blocks would be hugely beneficial to compress this, whereas if we're looking at this image, you know, having large blocks can actually be the downside because then we start having this visible block, so we don't want to be seeing that. Now we're going to talk about a completely different genre, I guess I would say, of compression, which is called temporal compression. Temporal compression. Sorry, I'm not very good at speaking and writing at the same time. Temporal compression. OK, so this means that we're compressing things over time, I guess I would say. This is also referred to as um, interframe compression because we're going um, between frames. So, so far we've been talking about almost entirely about intraframe compression. So we've got one frame and we're, you know, we're doing blocks and we're doing stuff like that inside it. With interframe compression, we have one frame, we have the next frame, Maybe we have three or maybe we have 30 frames and we're tracking changes from one to the next to the next and doing compression techniques that utilize many frames. 
This is also commonly referred to as long gop. A long gop codec is the one that uses these, these techniques. Gop stands for a group of pictures, long gop codec. So what does this inner frame thing, long gop thing mean? Let's say we've got one frame and we've got a, let's say it's a talking head. So we have someone's head here. And then in the next frame, you know, this is one, you know, one thirtieth, one twenty fourth of a second later. So maybe the expression has changed a little bit. Maybe he's about to sneeze, but all the background, all this stuff over here is exactly the same from one shot to the next, right? Everything behind the person's head is exactly the same. Well, so in a long, long, gop, long gop codec, the algorithm is going to say, hey, look, all this stuff around here is exactly the same from this frame to the next frame. So when we store this, we'll store the whole frame, the whole frame, and then we'll calculate what has changed in the next frame. And we will save only the difference between this frame and that frame. So the difference may be only, let's say we divide into blocks, which is something that frequently happens with codecs. You know, the difference may be only this little piece right here. So we only have to save, you know, maybe one fifth, less than a fifth, maybe one tenth of the whole image in this in this frame. So let's say that this image took, I don't know, one megabyte. It's not very realistic, but let's say in theory it did. Well, then the difference here is only, you know, 0 0.1 megabytes that we have to store. And then we'll go and keep on repeating this. And then the next one, the difference from, again, maybe only you know, 0 0.1, or actually, let's say his expression is exactly the same. You may actually have two, two frames that are almost exactly the same. So to store this one, it might be 0 0.05 megabytes to store the next frame. So you can see how this can make a huge difference in the efficiency of codec. If you had a codec that wasn't doing interframe compression, you would have to be storing one megabyte every single time for every frame. So this can save tons of space. The talking head is the most obvious example, but you'd be surprised how often you end up with shots in practical everyday video and film work where a large part of the image is the same from frame to frame. So here's a shot from a film of mine. As I play it, you'll see there are two people walking and there are birds going across the sky, but most of the shot does not change from frame to frame. So they can, you know, the algorithm can determine, oh, all of this stuff all the way over here. It's not really changing, so in every frame, you don't have to re restore the image every time. You can just say, well, use, use, use the image from the last frame. And even if the shot is moving, let's jump to another shot here where I'm, I'm panning, and most of the shot, except for the girl down here, is, is the same from frame to frame, only shifted. So the algorithm can say, okay, look at this, you know, these green shutters here, and you go to the next frame, and well, it looks like this is actually exactly the same as the last frame only shifted up a little bit. In fact, almost the entire image is exactly this, as the same as the last frame, but shifted up a little bit. And they can do very, very complicated, fancy algorithms that can look around and detect how things are moving. And if, if, if one part of the image is the same, but only shifted. Now the downside to this is let's say we have a, like we keep on going we keep on going, 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 calculating the difference all the way until let's say we've got the 30th frame. It is not all uncommon to have a group that's 30 frames long. So this is the 30th one. And every single time we've been copying over the difference. Let's say um, I, I jump, see this, this is my video editor, and I jump to a spot in the timeline that's on this frame right here. Well, what information do I have? Well, I only have the difference that's actually saved, you know, the zero, 0 0.1 megabyte difference. And that difference may only include this little square right here. So on this frame, all I've got is that little piece. I don't even know what's in the rest of this. I have to look back to the difference to this frame and add that and calculate and go back to this frame and then to this one and on and on and on 
all the way back to this one, then back to this one, and then all the way back to the original one, because none of these frames are storing this background. The background didn't change from frame to frame to frame, so nobody kept track of it, all the way back to the first frame. So if you, ima if you imagine that can be really inefficient, that, that may slow my computer down. Let's say I want to jump to the spot in the timeline. My computer basically has to, has to process 30 frames in order to show me one. If I'm playing forwards, that's not a problem. If I start over here, and I, I have the background information, then I make a small change, and I go over here and I make a small change, and that's easy. I can do that real fast, but I can't go backwards. So you can see this type of codec is really great for storing information, but it's not great for playing around with information. And the last thing to mention with this topic is something that you may hear with codecs called all I codec. Um, like the 5D Mark III has an all I setting. What does that mean? Basically what that, what that means is it's bypassing temporal compression. It's using a codec, um, well in the case of the 5D Mark III, um, it's using a codec called H.264, which is normally a long GOP codec, like what we talked about all this stuff over here. But when you go all I, what you're basically saying is no temporal compression. Every frame is like this one over here, where you've got the entire thing. You're not just calculating the difference between your frame and the last frame, you're, you're recording the entire frame every time. The other potential downside to temporal compression is that, um, let's say that we have these two frames here, and the second frame, the background is very similar to the first one, but not quite the same, something very slightly different. Maybe there's like a slight shimmering and some light, maybe there's a um, very slight movement. Um, well, the codec may say, well, there is a difference there, but we, we really want to compress, we really want to save space, so we'll just throw away the difference. Instead of recording a difference, we'll just throw it away and pretend that this image is the same as the previous one. And in some cases, that's fine because the viewer will never notice it, but there are times when that can be a problem because you're actually losing something. You might have like a really nice organic grain happening um, from frame to frame, and that's the kind of thing that can get sort of compressed away when you compress too hard. All right, we're getting close. A couple, couple more things to mention real quick. This one I'm just going to mention in passing um, a topic called lossless compression. And this is in comparison to lossy compression. So pretty much everything we've talked about so far has been this stuff lossy compression because you're losing information compressing the blocks down you're throwing away the colored data stuff like that you're doing a lossy compression throwing away some data but you're trying to do it really carefully in a way that won't really have much detriment to the final image lossless compression is a, a sort of a whole different category and it's something that's usually not used very much um, in video codecs because it's much slower to do but lossless is when you're going to the the, the, the bits the, the data instead of viewing the data as, as colors and things like that, you're viewing the data as numbers. And then there are lots of compression techniques that are used, the kind of things, if, like if you do a, like a zip file, or if you have like a, uh, there are a lot of different types, a lot of these different types of, um, of like compressed files um, that you, you come across on a desktop computer and things like that, those are usually lossless because you want to get back exactly what you put in so you don't lose anything. You might have something like a Huffman coding or something like that. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated topic and some of them get very, very intricate and it's really, you really don't have to worry about it too much when you're talking about codecs because 99 out of 100 codecs probably are gonna do a lossy compression, not this lossless stuff. So um, just, that's what it is in case you come across the term, but you don't have to worry about it too much. All right, just one more concept to cover, one more big concept that has to do with codecs, and that is bit rate. Bit rate. Sometimes, um, sometimes written as one word. But bit rate is basically how much data the codec uses. Now the most common notation for bit rate is gonna be in bits per second, and it'll be either kilobits per second or megabits per second. So kilobits per second, sometimes written as kilobits per second like that. 
or megabits per second or MB over S like that. And also when you're talking about bit rate, you want to make sure that you're talking about bits here, not bytes. One byte is equals eight bits. So if you see something like this, capital B per second, that is not equal to megabits per second. So if you have uh, something in megabits, you have to um, divide it by eight to get to the number of megabytes per second. And I'll show you why that's important in a minute. So we, now we know how to write it now, kilobits per second or megabits per second. Um, and occasionally you may see a megabytes per second, but that's rare. And of course, kilo is 1,000. So 1,000 bits per second, where, whereas megabits is 1 million bits per second. So this, is, this tells you how much data is being stored in the file every second. So let's take an example. Let's say I have a codec that is gonna give me eight megabits per second, okay? And I have a video that I'm gonna export and it's going to be um, five minutes long. And I wanna know, okay, how big is that file gonna be? Well, first of all, we have five megabits per second. And I wanna to get to megabytes because that's how I think about file sizes, like megabytes or gigabytes. So if we have eight megabits per second, um, we're gonna divide that by eight because eight is the number of bits in a byte. So we'll divide that by eight and that gives us one megabyte per second. And then now I need to translate into minutes. So there are 60 seconds in a minute. So I'm gonna multiply this times 60 and that will give me 60 megabytes per minute. And then I have five minutes. So I'm gonna multiply that by five. And that gives me 300 megabytes. So I have an eight megabit per second codec. First I translate into megabytes per second, dividing by eight. Then I multiply by 60 to get megabytes per minute. Multiply by number of minutes to get megabytes total in the file, right here. Now sometimes you get to choose what your megabit per second bit rate is, and sometimes you don't. So some cameras you can have multiple options, sometimes you don't, but this can give you a very easy way to know how big my file is gonna be. Now, if you have the option of changing it, of course, when you're recording with certain types of cameras, you can, and of course, when you're exporting, you can. What does the bitrate do to the image? Now, unfortunately, it's really hard to give a sort of a standard metric for what happens to an image when you change the bitrate. It really depends on the codec, and it also depends on uh, like where in the range of that codec sweet spot you are. So one codec might have sort of a sweet spot that's around eight megabits per second, and you know the sweet spot might be five to 20 or something like that. And certain, certain codecs will allow you to go like insanely high. Like you might have like an H.264, eight megabits per second for say, you know, 720p. So, you know, probably gonna look pretty good. And you might be able to go all the way to 200, something crazy. Like 200 megabits for 720p HD is way overkill for H.264. Like the improvement you get over 20 to 200 is not that great. Improvement you get from 5 to 20 might be huge, but it really depends on the codec. And the way you do this is just by testing it out. You know, Try each of them, bring them into your color correction or your editing program, do some color correction, um, try playing with the footage and, and trying to see, you know, is it good enough for you? Is it gonna fall apart if it's too low? Or is it overkill, it's taking up too much space if it's too high? Um, you can look on the internet to find opinions about a certain camera, a certain codec, um, and a certain bit rate for that codec. The difference you might see if you say like you take H.264 and you compress it really far down. Let's say we go even further, we go all the way down to like three megabits per second or two megabits per second. Then you're really gonna start seeing things like a lot more blocking, 
because the codec, you know, has to work really hard. It's got to compress really hard to fit that, fall, that small file size. And so you'll get more blocking. You'll get things like you'll get more, more temporal compression issues. Like you, you may get those differences um, that get eliminated from frame to frame where they should appear as differences or they might like delay. Like you might not get it until it hits, you know, like we talked about a, a group of 30, like a group of a GOP, 30 pictures where each one references the one before. You may get a change that doesn't actually update until 30 frames in, um, 30 frames after it's happened. Um, and sometimes it looks kind of like stuttering in the image. But it really depends on the image. It's impossible to give um, like an ideal, ideal bit rate for um, every image. It really depends. Like for the instance, the one you're looking at right now. Right now, there could be tons of blocking in this image and you would never know because all the blocking would be happening in a, in a pure black area. So I can, I can compress this image super, super hard and you'll never see the difference. And not only blocking, but say I have a long GOP codec here and I've got temporal compression going on. Well, right now I'm not drawing. Nothing is changing in this image. So every frame is looking at the previous frame and saying, hey, there's no difference. Don't record anything. And then the next frame, don't record everything. Don't record anything. Don't record anything. All the way up until the end of the GOP, like end of the group of pictures, like say it might be 30. I used 30 in my previous example. So I only have to record one frame for every 30 frames. I only have to write down the, the information for one for every 30th frame. And for the 29 frames in between, because nothing is changing, the, the codec can just say, oh, use the frame from last time, use a frame from last time. And so I could compress this image really, really, really hard with H.264 or, or another temporal compression codec with no issues at all. But if I'm shooting, you know, action sports, if I'm shooting, uh, I don't know, a chase scene or anything that has a lot of movement, well, then I can't compress nearly as much because things are changing frame to frame. And I need to have that room in my, in my codec. I need, I need those bits in order to write down all those changes. Now, generally speaking, the higher the bit rate, the better quality the image will be. Of course, you have, may have to make trade-offs because of the file sizes that get too big if you get too high. But generally speaking, the higher bit rate, the better you are within a certain codec. Bear in mind that different codecs vary widely in how efficient they are. So to take an example, say we have an H.264 codec at 8 megabits. I'm not sure why I keep choosing that one, but let's say 8 megabits per second. And let's say I have um, D, uh, uh, like a MPEG-2, which is sort of an older codec. It's not as advanced um, as H.264. And let's say I have 20 megabits per second on that MPEG-2. Well, actually, this H.264 is going to look much better because H.264, even though this 8 megabits per second is a, is a lower bit rate, and um, it's much, much more efficient. It's using much more advanced techniques than this MPEG-2, um, even though the MPEG-2 is at 20 megabits per second. So if you're you can't compare two different codecs by bit rate. You have to compare um, based on how that codec does. So you, so you would never say um, the MPEG-2 at 20 megabits per second is going to be better than H.264 at 8 megabits. Though, of course, H.264 at 20 megabits is going to be better than H.264 at 8 megabits. Now, I know a lot of you guys are going to wonder about raw video and how does raw fit into all of this. Now, raw video used to be sort of synonymous with uncompressed video. Though actually now there have come out some ways to compress raw video, um, such as the Red Code Reds codec that, that they use on, on like the Epic Scarlet um, and uh, the Red One cameras. That is a way of compressing the raw data, and it's it's actually lossy. So if you compress a Red Code too highly, it, you'll start you know your image will be degraded. Um, but if you compress it not very much, then it'll be very little. There are some um, raw codecs that do use lossless compression, so you have no detriment to the image by compressing it. But most of the compressed raw formats actually do have some negative impact on the image. Though I'm not going to get into the techniques that they use to compress raw because they're a bit more complicated um, and a lot more math, and I just don't want to get into all that right now. The benefits of raw video are very similar to the benefits of uncompressed video. You don't have to worry about any of the compression artifacts. That Compression artifacts are basically things that are bad in the image as a result of compression. Things like the blockiness we're seeing, 
things like the, the banding you see on a gradient sometimes, um, that sort of a thing. The, the, the other benefit that you get from a raw video over an uncompressed video, uh, the, the difference is that with raw, with uncompressed video, um, the data that's coming off of the sensor is still being interpreted by a chip on the camera, and that data is being um, manipulated and changed. And so you don't really get the, uh, quote unquote, the original, the quote unquote, raw data off of the sensor because it's being manipulated I may have color manipulation, things like that. Whereas the raw data, um, there's no processing going on inside the camera on that raw data. Now, real quick before we end, I'm gonna go back to this types of codecs topic I talked about earlier and talk a little bit about why you care about codecs at different stages. First of all, with capture, you wanna get the highest, you, know, you wanna get the most information that you can. You know, if we're talking about the techniques, 444 is great. It does take a lot more space, so that is a downside, but it gives you sort of more latitude. Um, so, but, but then again, a lot, of, a lot of cameras will only do an H.264 codec or a very fairly compressed codec, so you often just don't have choice there. With an edit codec, the main thing to think about with an edit codec is you don't want temporal compression. You don't want a long GOP codec when you're editing because it will slow you down a lot. So often I will convert from my capture codec into a much smaller edit codec that is not long GOP. So DNX HD, like I've written here, or ProRes is a great idea. Because those are those are not these do not use temporal compression. And then I will link back up to the original files on export. And then see, so yeah, I'll go to the delivery codec. It might be an H.264. Very likely will be if it's going to the internet because that's what everybody uses on the internet these days, and it's a very efficient codec. And and when I'm doing that, I'll I'll, I'll probably export at the highest that I can manage with my upload bandwidth and stuff like that. To, so it would be a pretty big file. And then I'll archive to a DNX HD, but this will be a different DNX HD than what I edited with. This will be a super, super high resolution, high quality one. I'll probably choose um, more or less the highest that's offered for DNX HD, because that way I can archive this file and I can always make a lower quality file after that if I want to. Um, because that way I have this super high quality version that's not suitable for uploading to the internet, but maybe if somebody, maybe you know, in a few years, there'll be another, another version of H.264. In fact, there will be. Um, and maybe I'll want to use that one later. And so I can, I can turn my DNX HD archive footage into you know, H.265 um, when, that, when that comes out. All right, that wraps up this tutorial on codecs. Thank you very much for watching. Um, if you found this helpful, please consider giving me a tip on the tip jar. I'd be greatly appreciated. I do all this stuff for free, and I really like to do it for free. Um, but I do spend a ton of time, and, and it takes a lot of work. And so if you could give me a few dollars as a tip, that would really help pay for my time um, for this tutorial and, of course, for the next tutorial. So and either way, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.